Dr. James Urbinski, a physician and scholar, is also an agent of social transformation. He and Dr. John Fraser co-founded Dignitas International, a medical care and research facility that operates in Malawi, one of Africa's poorest countries. Currently, the Dignitas Clinic supervises treatment for 267,000 HIV AIDS patients. Dignitas, um, I, when I was on their site today, I noticed that they offer a safe space for teenagers who contracted HIV through mother-to-child transmission. Dignitas International also executes highly respected research that provides evidence for effective policy intervention. Dignitas International is just one of Dr. Obinsky's roles as a social innovator. His award-winning book, An Imperfect Offering, examines the place of humanitarianism in the midst of violent social upheave, upheaval it offers a powerful insight into the origins of his tireless efforts to improve the world. Please welcome him as he reflects on 21st century health challenges. Thank you. So as you can see, dealing with health and food at a global level is a complex challenge. There are many, many different dimensions uh, to that challenge some of which have been touched on tonight, and some of which also include, if you're going to deal with any uh, uh, particular challenge in a very concrete, pragmatic, and meaningful way, must take account of states, must take account of civil society organizations, must take account of the private sector, must take account of international and multilateral uh, organizations, must take account of major foundations uh, that are major funders and major innovators in terms of new ideas around global health and food issues, and must also take account of one-man states like Bono, uh, who are major influencers uh, in terms of uh, policy, uh, normative policy uh, uh, changes. We live very much in a, a world where there are really two worlds. There's the, the world of the rich and there's the world of the poor. Life expectancy in North America is on average uh, 80 years. Life expectancy in South Africa is on average 40 years. That gap is changing, but it is changing ever so uh, slowly. We also live in a world where that inequity gap uh, is actually becoming more and more extreme for more for very particular vulnerable populations. So to deal with a, with a global uh, equity gap or to deal with global inequity, it's not enough to engage at a civil society level. It's not enough to simply try to uh, innovate around a charitable intervention. It's also not enough to deal at the macro level, to deal at the level, for example, of the United Nations, or to deal at the level of major commissions that seek reform in terms of global governance. To actually, as the illustration here very nicely demonstrates, to actually crack the inequity nut globally, you have to literally work from both ends, from grassroots and also at the macro level. And you have to think very carefully about how you intervene and how you actually structure the kind of uh, response uh, that you uh, uh, bring to bear uh, around that particular nut. I'm gonna give you two examples of, uh, of very concrete and very carefully thought through interventions uh, that attempted to work at the macro level, that also attempted to work uh, with multilateral institutions, that also attempted to work with civil society organizations, with the private sector, and with foundations. The first is the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. This initiative was started, I was the chair of the, of the working group that put this together. Uh, this was started 10 years ago, and it was designed to develop new treatments, new drugs, new diagnostics, and in some cases, new vaccines that would focus on the most neglected tropical diseases. 
what are some of the most neglected tropical diseases? Well, I won't go into great detail here, but here are just a few. Human African uh, trypanosomiasis, Chagas disease, pediatric uh, HIV AIDS, Leishmaniasis, filarial diseases, and uh, uh, my, um, uh, we call them mycelia diseases. These are just examples of diseases that affect now 11% or that account for 11% of all of the global morbidity and mortality in the world. In the last 11 years, there were 850 new products created by the pharmaceutical industry globally. And that's not necessarily new chemical entities, but new products um, uh, that are uh, designed to in some way uh, treat a uh, medical condition. Less than 4% of those 850 products were focused on neglected tropical diseases. And the reason is that neglected tropical diseases occur in large measure among the poorest of poor people. And so the pharmaceutical industry is not interested in developing medicines that it, that it can not make a profit on by selling them to poor people. Because why? Poor people don't have money. If they don't have money, you can't take it from them and in sufficient quantity to make the kind of profit that you're interested in. So less than 4% of all new pharmaceutical products uh, in the last uh, 11 years were focused on uh, neglected tropical diseases. So the DNDI was created in order to deal with that problem. So we basically created, through Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Doctors Without Borders, the Indian Medical Research Council, the Malaysian Medical Research Council, Pharma Guinness in Brazil, uh, and then a consortium of 15 African research centers. We basically created a public sector or publicly interested board that made up the governing body of the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. We sought funding from uh, nation, certain nation states and from certain uh, foundations. Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, capitalized the creation of DNDI with 50 million euro a year for the first few years. And now 10 years later, the DNDI has created and has brought to uh, the so-called market seven new treatments. Uh, seven new drugs, two new antimalarials, a new treatment for leishmaniasis, a new treatment for trypanosomiasis, uh, and a new treatment for pediatric Chagas disease. The drugs are designed with the end user in mind, and they're designed uh, according to the parameters that the end user uh, requires in order to take the medications. So for example, humidity and refrigeration are key, considera key considerations. Does the drug need to be uh, uh, refrigerated? Yes or no. Does it, uh, can it survive or can it maintain its molecular integrity in high humid environments? Yes or no. And so if those are design parameters, uh, we would only bring a drug through the entire R&D process uh, if those design parameters can be met. The R&D process is very simple. It's basic research, it's translation of that research into a chemical, uh, into a, a, a compound. It's development of that compound, and then it's implementation, and then following imp implementation is post-market monitoring and research. These are examples here, I won't go through them all, but these are examples of the, the 18 different new chemical entities that are now still in the R&D pipeline. There is not one lab that is the property of the DNDI. It is a virtual organization. The office is based, the main office is based in Geneva, and it is management tools and very, very well-defined um, administrative tools that allow for the subcontracting of key components of that R&D pipeline, and that allow the organization to bring to bear in very short order uh, concrete results like the uh, new medic medicines that I have uh, talked about. The second example I want to give you is Dignitas. <clears throat> Dignitas is a not-for-profit, uh, non-government organization that I also uh, founded about 10 years ago in 2004, so that's 11 years ago. We founded Dignitas because the name itself, because of what is reflected in the name, dignity. 
We saw in the, uh, many people who were living with HIV and dying with HIV, a lack of recognition of their basic dignity as human beings. One of the key issues was not then in 2004 access to medicines. That issue had in fact largely been solved. The issue was healthcare systems and the, the ability of healthcare systems to actually deliver those medications to people who needed them. And so in Malawi, one of the countries where the, uh, uh, the impact of the HIV epidemic was the most profound in the world, in Malawi there were entire regions of the country that were virtually, uh, uh, that had already virtually collapsed. Several nations, in fact, were on the verge of collapse. Botswana uh, uh, being one of them, and Alan Whiteside uh, may actually uh, refer to uh, a couple of others uh, in the Q&A. At that time, in 2004, HIV AIDS was a profound existential threat to the viability of several nations and to many uh, communities. So we focused on Malawi and the southern region of Malawi, and we focused on building and working with the Ministry of Health, hand in hand, to uh, build and design a healthcare system that could actually deliver community-based uh, care and access to treatment for people living with HIV in the southern region. There are 265 doctors in Malawi. Malawi is a population of 15 million. Ontario is a population of 15 million. In Ontario, we have 26,753 doctors. And so dealing with that kind of difference, dealing with that kind of profound inequity in terms of structural inequity, required an innovative approach to how we uh, delivered uh, 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 care. So we worked hand in glove with the Ministry of Health, and now 10 years later, 1.4 million people in the southern district of Malawi have been tested for HIV. There are over, we've started over 267,000 men, women, and children on full treatment uh, for uh, HIV in 163 different clinics in rural and remote village areas and in three hospitals in the southern region of the country. We train more than 500 Malawian healthcare workers every single year. And the other key thing, and this is my final point, the other key thing is that we built into the design of the organization a commitment to research. Why? Well, you cannot deal with food insecurity. You cannot deal with global health issues with simple knee-jerk responses. We have to think carefully about what we do. We have to think carefully in the complex reality of the context in which we work. States, multilateral organizations, civil society organizations, private sector actors, foundations, grassroots organizations. We have to think very carefully about how you work within that complex ecosystem of actors. And if you think carefully, you can achieve massive results and massively important results. And that's why for, for uh, Dignitas, over the last 10 years, we have 50 major research publications, some of which are recognized by The Lancet and other journals as among the best science in the world. So this is really an example uh, of what you can do with a careful, thoughtful, interventionist approach uh, to improving health and to improving uh, food security. And this is why institutions like this, the Basili School, this is why they're so important because you can come to a school like this and you can experience transdisciplinary thinking. You can, you can experience and you can learn how to approach a complex problem in a practical, meaningful, and viable way. And so with that, let me just finish by saying that the only way to achieve greater equity in global health is that it requires innovation. And the only way that we're gonna get genuine innovation is if we think carefully about the context and about our interventions. And, then, uh, and that is the only way that uh, we will overcome inequity. So thank you.